Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Merlin now. He's a PhD candidate in computer science at the Friedrich Alexander University Stadt Erlangen Nuremberg in collaboration with Siemens Health and Ears. Our expert panelist behind the scenes today is Wesley Gohn. He's a research professional at Siemens Health and Ears, and he earned a PhD in physics from the University of Connecticut. So with that, uh, Wes, uh, Merlin, sorry if you'd like to come on and please start. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And also thank you to D-Wave for giving us the opportunity to uh, have this webinar. So as you've read, the topic of today's webinar is quantum computing for medical image reconstruction. So without further ado, let's just jump into it. Um, but before that, I just want to quickly introduce the team who has been working on the project. And this is actually compromised of uh, two sides, the semen health engineer side, namely the SPECT research side uh, of Alexander Hans Wicher, Wes, and uh, Maximilian Reimann. And then um, I am still a PhD student uh, enrolled at the Pattern Recognition Lab at the Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlang Nuremberg under the supervision of Professor Andreas Meyer. So, also thank you for the team. Now, um, as some of you may not know what a SPECT scanner is or a SPECT CT, on the left side, you can see a picture of a SPECT CT scanner. And as the name says, it's basically compromised of two systems. The SPECT system, which stands for Single Photon Emission Computer Tomography, which is a functional imaging technique. And then you have the CT scanner in the background, which is an anatomical uh, imaging technique. At Siemens Health Engineers, uh, our mission is to modernize nuclear medicine and also to support the clinical needs of the future. So as I'm sure some of you are not familiar with what functional or molecular imaging is, let me just give you a quick recap here what is happening. So in functional imaging, you start by injecting a small amount of a radio pharmaceutical to the patient. This is a radioactive isotope which emits gamma radiation and is basically bound to a tracer which transport the isotope to a target tissue in the human body, maybe the bone, the brain, or the heart. When once this has settled, you acquire a SPECT and a CT scan after a specified time. So as you've seen in the picture just before, the SPECT scanner has these two detectors. And these two detectors are basically rotating around the patient. And at each view, these detectors are taking a so-called projection image. Now, because we don't know where exactly the radiation is coming from, in contrast to CT, for example, we have to have a collimator in front of our detector, which actually narrows down the direction of where those photons are coming from. Once you have now acquired all of these projection images from all of the different directions around the patient, you can actually then reconstruct your image. And this is actually what I'm going to be talking about today mostly. And after that, there comes the visual and the quantitative interpretation of these 3D images. Now, to just give you some examples of the Siemens uh, Healthy Nearest products which are available, I wanted to highlight uh, one example here. This is not done with quantum computing, but with classical computing. However, I think this is a good motivation for this talk. So what you can see on this slide actually is a patient who has some spinal stabilization screws screwed in. And what the images now tell you is you have the SPECT scan, which is on the top or left. Let me pull up a laser pointer here. You have the SPECT scan on the top or left, and this actually shows the functionality of the tissue or the metabolism within the bone. On the lower side, you have the CT with the virtual rendering technique, and you can see all of these metal screws which are screwed into the patient. On the right side to this now, you can see the CT without metal artifact reduction, and then there is the corrected version without metal artifacts or corrected for metal artifacts. Now, when you look at this uh, SPECT scan now, it shows you the metabolism within the bone. And we can see when we overlay this with the CT image that the patient actually has an increased uh, metabolism, uh, hypermetabolism in the left L3A4 facet joint. 
And this now results in loosening of the joint and accelerated osteoarthritis. So the patient actually suffers from a condition which is called facet arthropathy. Uh, so the cartilage in these joints wears down fast and the patient probably has back pain. So what you can uh, read out here, you can see that we did 60 stops per detector and 20 seconds per stop to catch all of these gamma photons. On the subsequent slide now, you can see um, you can see some more images of this exact same patient from different directions. And I think that the visual um, quality of these images is really good. Now, what the advantage of MI is, is that it's a functional imaging technique. So what you actually visualize is the metabolism or the physiology of the patient in contrast to anatomical imaging like CT. And the interesting thing is that you can actually measure physiological change before the anatomical change occurs. And as you've seen in the uh, images before, we can fuse this information to gather multimodal information of both CT and SPECT, which ideally leads to earlier diagnosis, earlier treatment, and earlier treatment adoption, so that we have the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Now, this was it for the medical motivation of this talk. Uh, as quantum computing is still in its uh, early beginnings, um, we have to kind of make our problem a little bit smaller. And that's what we did for this exact project. So let me introduce you a little bit to the mathematical concepts behind tomography. And one thing that we have to know is the forward model. So let us imagine we have this cube X, which is our true activity distribution. And we can subdivide this cube into a number of voxels. And each of these voxels then has an average number of photons, which are being emitted from this voxel. Now, when we take our specs again around the patient, what we actually do is we measure the photons that are being emitted in this direction. So you can see that the detector here, Y, actually captures the number of photons detected in each of these data bins. And these are called our projection measurements or a sinogram. Now, how does this relate to the true activity distribution? This depends on our system. And we can describe our SPECT system with a so-called system matrix. So you can think of the system matrix if we linearize our images and linearize our projections, that one entry in the system matrix describes the probability of a photon that's being emitted in voxel I is recorded in a data bin J of the detector. This is basically the part where you, where you image the patient. Now, when we want to reconstruct the patient, we actually end up with an ill-posed inverse problem. We have the measured data, we can approximate our system, but we do not know the true underlying activity distribution. And because we have noise in our data, photon noise, which is inherent if we are working with gamma rays and working with short acquisition times, we are suffering from noise. So if you would want to reconstruct the true activity distribution, you would have to take a large number of scans repeatedly and calculate the expectation value or the mean of all of these uh, acquisitions. So a common model, what people use is this model of some additive noise uh, added to the measurement that you take. Now, um, we try to model our system as best as possible in the reconstruction process. But where we can compare it is actually this projection space. And that is exactly what common reconstruction techniques often try to minimize. They try to minimize the distance of our approximation of the system matrix, forward projecting our reconstructed activity distribution, and then comparing it with the measurements that we took in an L2 um, fashion, basically. And usually people use iterative techniques for this because the system matrix becomes very large. So why would we want to get started with quantum computing? So quantum computing presents a new algorithmic paradigm. It utilizes quantum mechanical phenomena to solve complex problems with phenomena such as entanglement and superposition. And the hardware advances very quickly. 
On the right side, you can see a uh, chip manufactured by D-Wave, and we have used the QPU of D-Wave as well as some associated hybrid solvers in this project. So when we now look at our problem again, we can see that our reconstruction process is essentially the, sol uh, the solving of a linear system of equations. And linear systems of equations have been solved with quantum computing already, or approaches to solve them have been proposed. So our forward model or for forward problem is this matrix multiplication uh, times the true activity distribution. And the inverse problem is then basically finding the inverse of that matrix. However, our matrix may is, is singular, it may be non-square, it has a high condition number. So it, it, it is um, hard to do this in practice. Now, some of the algorithms which have been, have been proposed with quantum computing to solve this problem is the Harold Hasidim Lloyd algorithm, also known as the LCHL algorithm. And this runs on gate-based hardware. But however, this does not run on near-term near intermediate scale, uh, intermediate uh, noisy quantum um, computing devices so far, as well as it is limited to low condition numbers of the matrix. However, it in theory provides an exponential speed up. Then there is also the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. It's an optimization algorithm also running on near term quantum hardware. And one of the papers that actually got us going in this project was the matrix inversion on quantum annealers by Rogers and Singleton proposed in 2020. Now, they basically treat this also as an optimization problem. And this is actually something which D-Wave um, chips are known to be very good at, at optimizing a combinatorial optimization problem and finding the lowest energy solution to an optimization problem. And this is what you see in this energy landscape here. So in an optimization problem, you're always interested in finding the lowest energy solution. Now, quantum computing in medical imaging has been uh, an uprising topic in the last few years. Um, I have some examples here prepared and some examples which have been um, published in the last couple of years. One of them is the classification of medical images using quantum orthogonal neural networks. These are based on gate-based hardware. Then we, as initial start, tried the segmentation um, notebook, which is offered on the GitHub of D-Wave. So we basically did a uh, unsupervised segmentation of this functional uh, brain image here um, just to get us going. Now, the reconstruction of medical images has also been proposed with quantum computers, starting with Kiani et al. in 2020, proposing solutions for reconstructing MR and CT data. Then also last year, June et al. Uh, released a paper on solving uh, quantum uh, on solving CT image reconstruction using quantum uh, op using a quantum optimization algorithm. And then last but not least, we also brought up a paper which is basically containing the work that I'm presenting today uh, using our algebraic formulation or this L2 um, style optimization of the reconstruction problem, which you can find on archive. And I encourage you to look into it and I would be very happy if you would read it. Now, when you, we want to formulate this problem for the quantum annealer, we know that the quantum annealer is good at solving so-called quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems, so-called cubos. And these cubos, they consist of the binary qubits called X, and then we have some linear interaction as well as some coupling interaction between two qubits. So we have quadratic interaction at most. So if we look at our equation again, f of x here, uh, where m is the system matrix, x is our linearized, in this simplified case now binary image, and y are our linearized projection, we can see that this equation actually at most has quadratic interactions. So this can actually be translated to a cubo. And this is what uh, Rogers and Singleton basically also showed in their paper, that you can do that. Now, how can we actually do this now? So as we've seen, if you have a binary image, we can directly map this to the quantum annealer where one pixel then um, is actually one qubit. 
We can also embed this as an integer problem when we represent one pixel value as a power series of multiple qubits. But last but not least, we can also utilize D-Wave's hybrid solvers. And these hybrid solvers now uh, basically combine the best of both worlds. We have the classical computing power and we have the quantum annealers. Now, when we look at our problem and embed a binary image uh, reconstruction problem on uh, the QPU, we can see the graph that is embedded on the QPU on the top left and, and, and on, the, on the bottom left. Now, this example for an image size of four by four, the histogram shows us that the solution with the uh, minimum energy uh, also occurs at the maximum uh, number of solution occurrences. So this is actually what we want to see. However, if we grow an image size, our graph gets more and bigger and bigger, and we still it's still fully connected. So our target histogram does not look as nice anymore, and the lowest energy solution does not occur as often anymore. And this is why we have particularly decided also to utilize the hybrid solvers to uh, enable our reconstruction. Now, um, the hybrid solvers offer the possibility to run constrained quadratic models, CQMs, and you can now not only have binary variables, but you can also have discrete integer uh, and also floating point uh, values. I think if the floating point uh, variables are uh, only dependent on linear terms, but I'm sure that D-Wave knows more about this than I do. And further, you can also introduce equality and inequality constraints. Now, let us just um, dive into the reconstruction workflow that is basically happening. So let us imagine this binary image of this uh, tree right here. And we imagine that we have these two detectors capturing um, basically the, the tree from each of these sides, which is basically uh, simulated. Now, the reconstruction process is now done as I have shown you. We basically do this in this L2 square uh, optimization fashion and embed this on the hybrid solver. Once we get returned our histogram of solutions, we filter it for a feasible solution and then choose the solution with the minimum energy, which is then our reconstruction. From this reconstruction, we can now measure the error to the ground truth object. So you can now see uh, all of the pixels which have been predicted wrong in either black or white. And now when we want to analyze this on a in a quantitative fashion, we can also compute the root mean square error. And this is um, one method that we have used to evaluate our reconstruction technique. So let us just dive into a little bit of the code demo. Now, these are just a few snippets from our code basically, but I think these are one of the, or some of the most crucial steps. So what we start off is we um, enable our matrices with SymPy um, and we create this for the system matrix, our, for our reconstructed image and for our measurements. Now we multiply M with X minus Y and then take the power of two to get our expression. That is our objective that we want to minimize. We create our constrained quadratic model create the variables that we want to solve for, and then set the objective for the CQM. We substitute the self loops because it is not a binary problem. And then we sample the CQM on the leap uh, hybrid CQM sampler, which returns us a sample set, which we can then sample for feasible solutions and then take the solution which is associated with the minimum energy. So we wanted to evaluate this basically in terms of three different categories. One thing that we were interested in is how large can the images that we want to reconstruct actually be? And then secondly, we were interested in noise. And lastly, we were interested in how underdetermined can our system actually be? So how many views do we actually have to take to achieve a reconstruction? So in terms of image size comparison, we start off with binary images here. And the binary images we have reconstructed up to size 32 by 32. And you can see four examples here. 
So we have this, uh, this snowflake here. We have this tree that you've already seen here. We have this, this cell here, and we have some kind of molecule here. Now, the first uh, column corresponds to the ground truth. The second one is the sinogram. So these are by basically the projections that we measure uh, by rotating around the object. FBP is uh, short for filtered back projection. This is a very old and conventional reconstruction technique. Uh, SART stands for simultaneous algebraic reconstruction technique. This is an iterative reconstruction technique, uh, which has become more and more um, powerful in the last couple of years with the advancements of classical computing hardware. Then in the second to last uh, column, we have the pseudo inverse solution. So basically just computing the pseudo inverse of the system matrix. And then in the last row, we have our hybrid based um, solution. And in all of these four images, you can see that the hybrid based um, reconstruction basically performs great without error. And you can also see that on the right side. So as we increase an in image size, the error remains at zero just as the pseudo inverse solution. Now, what we can already see here is that SART performs uh, quite bad. And um, this is due to the small image size that we took, as well as this is discrete images that we are working with now and not floating point valued images. So I just want you to keep that in mind that the SART uh, results may not be comparable at this small image uh, size scale. Now, when we look at the integer images, we chose the binary, uh, we chose the uh, Shabloden phantom, which is a very popular uh, phantom being used in medical images. And we also compared this on a size four by four up to 32 by 32. And what we have seen here is that uh, the quantum uh, annealing or hybrid based uh, reconstruction actually becomes noisier as we go larger in image size. When we try to get these reconstructions better, we realized that when we increase the time of the hybrid solver, we could actually achieve better reconstructions also of larger image size. However, when this uh, reconstruction time goes up, it is not uh, comparable to classical reconstruction techniques anymore. So we left it at the initial um, configuration. So what you can see is basically that the root mean square error at uh, size by eight by eight kind of uh, goes up. So we decided to do an evaluation in terms of noise on uh, eight by eight images. And this is exactly uh, what is coming now, the noise evaluation. So to actually introduce some noise in our system, which uh, should mimic our Poisson noise or photon noise, which is the noise that we have in reality as best as possible. We wanted to aim to um, simulate the noise for each projection. Because in reality, we also have our noisy activity distribution and we capture our noisy measurements. So what we did is in each projection, we added a, a noise um, following a discrete uniform distribution to our uh, activity. And because our values can never be uh, below zero, because you can never have less than zero counts, um, we have subtracted minus one, left it or added one if the value was unequal to zero. And if the value was equal to zero, we have either left it unaltered or added one. Now, when we investigate this now in terms of a digits data set, uh, having values of the pixels um, of four bits, so zero to 16, we can see that in the um, reconstruction uh, with no noise that our QA performs well, it performs similar to the PI. Again, the, the SART algorithm is not really comparable here because we have this small image size. Now it becomes interesting when we add noise because our pseudo inverse uh, based uh, reconstruction cannot handle this noise anymore and results basically in a corrupted reconstruction. Now, when we compare these uh, reconstructions now in terms of the root mean square error, 
we can see that if we don't have noise, the pseudo inverse base solution is slightly better than the hybrid base solution. Now, if we have introduced noise now, as we have seen the pseudo inverse solutions, they do not compare anymore to the ground truth. But we want, interestingly, what we can also see is for all of these 32 images that we compared that the hybrid based solution yielded a better uh, reconstruction result in terms of the root mean square error compared to the other three reconstruction techniques. Now, let us go to the last bit of the evaluation, and this is the underdetermined evaluation. So how many views do we actually have to take? And because this is easiestly done on these binary images, because there we don't have that many possibilities, we actually also only need very few views. So let us compare the same four images that uh, I have shown you on the previous slides on this slide. Again, we have our snowflake, tree, cell, and molecule. And what we can see is when we have two views, the reconstruction of the hybrid-based um, reconstruction technique actually real, yields a pretty good example uh, yields a pretty good result here the same goes for the tree however as we have some components within the cell or have more high frequency components our reconstruction becomes a little noisier but we can see that there is definitely a positive trend especially here in the snowflake that the reconstruction here of 4 by 4 is almost identical to the ground truth the same goes for the tree. Now, when we look at this on a quantitative scale, what we know or what we saw is that the root mean square error, uh, the variance of the reconstruction of the hybrid based reconstruction actually is larger than the other reconstruction techniques. And this is mainly due to the objects that we chose with the high frequency components, um, but it is comparable to um, conventional techniques. and. Also, interestingly, here I'm only showing you some plots containing the root mean square error, but there's also a very popular technique to analyze uh, reconstructions or to analyze or to compare uh, images to ground truth images, which is called the structural similarity index. And this is actually part of the evaluation in our paper. And one thing that is uh, what I think I should point out here is in terms of the structural similarity index, the reconstruction of these um, few view reconstructions were actually uh, better than all of the other three reconstruction techniques. So with this, uh, I already want to come to an end uh, and I want to leave some time for some questions. So uh, to conclude this talk, what we have seen is this reconstruction pipeline on the right side. So we have seen how to do image reconstruction um, of tomographic uh, images using uh, D-Wave's hybrid solvers. We have demonstrated robustness to noise and also the ability to reconstruct from few measurements. So um, as sort of an outlook, um, what we want to do in the future, we want to explore other use cases with quantum annealing and hybrid based solvers and expand the current approaches, as well as to experiment with other quantum computing technologies. And with this, I would like to conclude my talk, and I thank you very much for your attention. I would also like to thank D-Wave again for giving us the opportunity. We have now been working for about one and a half years on this project together with them, and I also want to particularly thank uh, Alex Kosigi and uh, Shannon Sikula from D-Wave for um, your effort on this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Merlin. We do have some questions. Um... Uh, Wes has been answering a number of them during the talk, but we have some that I would like to read out to you. So the first one is, quantum computing algorithms do not give one final solution, they provide many solutions. So how are these algorithms used in the medical uh, area? So um, as you may have seen in uh, the reconstructions that we do now, these uh, the quantum computing technology that we investigate is not used in a medical product right now. and um, yeah, that that is basically to say that. Yeah, but I guess I guess the question is, is there value in getting multiple solutions in in this area as opposed oh, to okay. That's okay. I, I see. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. So 
in terms when we were looking back at this optimization landscape of the problem. So um, right now, we are never sure that we basically end up in a uh, global minimum. And if we get more and more solutions and can also compare these solutions to ground state and evaluate them, I think this is a, a very uh, important thing and uh, could be of great interest in the future as well. Okay. Um, does quantum method tolerate noise well? I think you answered these, but is binary enough to represent functional molecular images? So, yes. So, um, I don't think that binary images are enough to represent functional images. So, these binary images, they are usually, you could um, take this to an equivalent of an industrial application where you would have a certain material that you would scan, which only has uh, one density, for example. However, we had to start somewhere. So, we started off with binary, then went to integer, and at some point, uh, you may be able to do floating point or even large scale integer reconstructions. Okay. Uh, how are integer variables embedded in the quantum solver? That is a question I think D Wave would have to answer because I am not sure. So we have seen that you could embed um, a pixel value as this power series, but uh, how it is actually implemented in the D Wave solver, I am not sure about. Part of the secret sauce. Yes. <laughs> uh, are quantum machine learning models more black boxes than regular machine learning and DL models? If so, does it matter? That's a very interesting question. And I've actually attended a conference on quantum computing uh, a couple of months ago. And so one of the things that is being heavily investigated in the machine learning community is the explainability of these models. And even with the classical models, the explainability is still very, very limited. So uh, I asked the speaker who gave that talk, basically, if there are already methods for the explainability of quantum machine learning methods. And he did not know of uh, any so far. But I think that basically fusing this uh, black box of machine learning with a technique that only few people understand very well uh, definitely needs a uh, great improvement in terms of explainability and, and how it actually works. And I think that is uh, an area of research which will be uh, very interesting for the upcoming years. Okay. Uh, do you have any intuition why the errors occur mostly at the border region of your studied shape? So I do not have an intuition why exactly that is happening. But um, tomographic image reconstruction techniques in general, they are um, bad at these high frequency components of the images. And these are exactly the edges of the image. So I can imagine that this basically is a uh, problem of most reconstruction techniques, including this hybrid based approach. Okay. Uh, what's the advantage that you foresee for quantum annealing over classical methods for this application? Doesn't need to be a currently achieved advantage, but more of where do you see a feasible route of advantage and improvements over classical methods? Mm -hmm. So I think that in, as I've mentioned, this, this binary case so far, I think I have seen the most promising results. So I think that for industrial applications, that this could become relevant. It could also become relevant in, in, in sort of um, task where feature selection is important, also specifically for reconstruction, which also these uh, quantum annealers are known to be good at. So um, this, is, this is some of the promise that I see. However, image reconstruction heavily relies on the um, computational power of this technology. And we have seen in classical computing that the power of these machines had to you know rise heavily to get to the point where we are today i don't think that quantum computing can replace it so far but i do see potential uh, especially in the quality of the solutions that we are maybe able to get as well as maybe at some point in the future we may even see some improvement in terms of time which is definitely uh, important uh, if you compare this for example to iterative reconstruction techniques right now. Okay, next question. If you are getting multiple solutions, how do you quantify the most effective? 
So um, what we have done so far is we have taken the solution which is associated with the lowest energy. You could, of course, optimize to use the solution, for example, which has the lowest structural similarity index. But then how do you translate this to taking a sample out of your sample set that you are being returned? So um, to basically, you know, make this comparable, we always just chose the uh, solution which was associated with the lowest energy. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, I know we're not going to get to them all, but a couple more. Um, can quantum computing be used in machine visions applications for finding defects from images dynamically? For example, in the semiconductor equipment industry for finding out defects on photo masks, dynamically as photo masks, photo masks are scanned and images obtained on CCDs. I don't know if that's something you can answer, but... I, I think I have actually heard of a project that is dealing with uh, something like this. So they are interested in identifying um, identifying um, problems in images of a manufactured joint, I believe it was. Um, I am not sure who uh, that project corresponded to, but uh, I think this is already done. And I think in terms of that, this is mostly uh, classification um, techniques. So um, that would be something to, to look into maybe. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's say two more. Um, can you explain why the QA-based reconstruction is less sensitive to noise than the classical ones? That is a good question. And I don't think that I can explain it um, as of now. Uh, I, the way that I think of it is that basically with these uh, QA-based reconstructions, you're able to uh, get solutions which you were not able to get in the classical sense or that you would have to um, you know, compute way longer in the classical sense. So the way that you we viewed this quantum kneeling reconstruction is that it actually provides us of a larger number of solutions and we maybe are returned with a solution that has a, a, a lower energy. So, um, so I think that 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 is how how we have kind of thought about about this topic. Okay. And last question: Is there also a three D approach? So um, actually, so all of these examples that you have seen are two D. Um, we have not done this three D for now because the size of the images simply you know, it uh, it gets bigger the more dimensions that you add to it. However, this approach is actually um, directly extendable to 3D because you linearize your uh, reconstructed image. What you have to be careful with now is um, this was basically some kind of toy example. And the system matrix for a 32 by 32 case is still, um, you know, storable on a classical computer. But as we get uh, to bigger three-dimensional image sizes, the, the clinical images that we have today are size 512 by 512 by 512. The system matrix grows and is not even, um, you know, representable on classical computing anymore. So what is done uh, in the classical world right now is that you compute the um, the system matrix basically on the fly. So you just compute the components that you need right now. Um, so this is something that would probably also go into the direction in the future if you would want to introduce this um, with quantum computing as well and 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 make this 3D. Okay, but in great. principle, in principle, it is extendable to 3D. So um, we've had a few more questions about uh, copies of the slides and the recording. So we will be sending mm -hmm. out emails to everyone who registered with links to the recording and the slides sometime this week. Um, I will. There are a lot of remaining questions we don't have time for, but I will send them along um, to Merlin and the Siemens team. And if they have time, I'm sure they will respond over email. So thank you all so much for attending. And thank you so much to Merlin and to uh, Hans and to Wes for being great panelists. So again, thank you all so much for coming. And thank you again, Merlin. Thank you so much, Susan.